Hello, this is Albert Einstein. History myths fly around at the speed of light. Especially with that new internet thing you all seem to have. Thank goodness, I have a direct connection to Professor Buzzkill, a fellow deep thinker who busts myths and takes names. I'm totally stoked. There's a new episode. I was stuck on this new equation anyway. E equals MC something. Something. Nah. Hello there, Buzz Killers. We're back. And what's more important, Professor Nash is back to talk to us about the war in the Pacific from 1944-ish until the very, very end of the d- This is the long defeat of Japan episode. Professor, how are you? I'm doing great. We're going to bring it home. We're going to bring it home. Uh, thanks so much for coming back. You know, you, we spend weeks and weeks and weeks between these shows and and you're always willing to come back. It's just great. It's because I have no life. I'll just oh, go well, ahead and just put that right out there. We don't want, to, I don't want anybody <laughs> to know that. But we do want to tell the buzz killers that uh, the Dutch of buzz kill is now today under the day that we're recording is under flood alert. So if you hear sirens in the background or if we have to scurry away to higher ground, you'll know what happened. Um, uh, and certainly if you hear thunder and all the the gods of, of weather raining down on us, that's what's going on. I apologize for that, but it might happen. The the, the royal flood services are fully activated. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll survive probably, probably, <laughs> but we can't go into the bunker because that will flood. So there we go. So, Professor, we, we've gotten up to middle of 1944 end of 1944 what's going on what's the situation in what, the pacific what, you need a little sit rep uh so yeah wait wait, wait, wait. <laughs> sit rep what is the <laughs> situation report I think oh is okay okay I, I'm, I'm 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 way out of my lane here you so. military guys yeah <laughs> policy, so, foreign policy yeah, guys. sorry so the defense the japanese defense perimeter which uh 1942 at its peak was quite large by this point is much smaller they've been pushed back the u.s island hopping campaign has uh made considerable progress toward japan by mm-hmm. seizing control of a number of major island chains mid-1944 the americans seized saipan and the marianas which is within b-29 bomber range of japan okay i mean that's extremely important yeah and the 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 bomber is is perfect for that range it's it's 1500 miles each way and that's a bomber that that can do that or it's it's one of our it's it's the it's the unsung wonder weapon that actually cost more than the atomic bomb to develop interesting little fun fact yeah three billion dollars let's do a show on that we should do it it deserves its own show no question so so in, in, in a way does that mean in addition to the bombing that could could have and was done from china you've now got bombing coming in from the right and the main effort the main effort partly because the chinese as the americans are going to find out the hard way the chinese bases are very vulnerable to Mm. japanese counterattack. that also happens in 1944 uh the the main bases are going to be in the marianas and there's going to be a massive uh, bomber effort from there. Th- this bombing campaign from China and then the Marianas starts in late 1944. It's not very effective at first. Mm-hmm. It takes months for the Americans to sort of perfect their tactics. But it does begin. The Japanese are tied down still in, in Burma and China. Uh, they, they're holding on to Burma, uh, but and holding on, they still score major victories in China, but they never knock China out, and it's still a massive commitment. It's yeah. probably about a million Japanese troops tied down in China. Japan's ability to wage combined war, which is to say sort of uh, the combined air, sea, land, that that ability to wage combined war has been destroyed. They can really no longer project power the way they could in 1942. Yeah. With big aircraft carrier task forces, that sort of thing. And one of the things you stressed in that show, the pre- the previous show, was how much further advanced that sort of uh, military technology and tactics were on the oh, Japanese side. Oh, early on, side. absolutely. Early on, they were they were superior in, yeah, in almost in, every, in almost right, every way. Right, right. But by 1944, they've completely lost that superiority. Yeah. They, first of all, among other things, they've lost their core of skilled pilots. Yeah, and so American pilots are getting better and better, and Japanese pilots are getting worse and worse. Yikes! So I shouldn't completely yikes. It makes it sound like I'm, we're obviously anti. Uh, militarism on this show but, right but, but it is, uh, the, the change is remarkable within a couple of years exactly right and so and the japanese by 1940 late 1944 the japanese are barely you know, all their effort is into holding on to what they have mm-hmm. and they can barely excuse me they can barely manage to resupply and uh, reinforce their existing defense perimeter 
Right. So forget oh, okay. about projecting power beyond it and by maybe getting into a major uh, naval battle with the Americans. They're basically just holding on and just trying to re resupply their their existing garrisons. The, the key campaigns have been lost, basically. Japan okay. is clearly okay. losing the war. By any objective standard, there's no way by late 1944 they're going to turn this around. But what they have done, and if you're wondering, like, okay, so why are they still fighting on? They have, by this point, they've changed their tactics when it comes to defending islands. Oh, okay. Okay, so not necessarily overall strategy but but tactics right or or to put it this way um the combined effect of tactical um changes they hope will have a strategic impact so okay. in other words all right, all right, and so, right. and to explain what i'm talking about is they've lost control of the air lost control of the sea originally they would defend islands on the beaches and they'd mm. be creamed by american firepower sure so vulnerable. by this point they've change tactics and what they do is they fortify the interior of islands remember a lot of these pacific islands even though they may be small they're very very rugged mm -hmm. some of them have mountain ranges on them deep ravines dense tropical rainforest um and so the japanese decide to take advantage of that basically la allow Amer an american invasion force to land virtually unopposed uh -huh. or largely unopposed and then make it very, very difficult and painstaking and costly for the Americans to seize the interior of the island. Is this, I mean, this may be, well, maybe almost certainly is an over, oversimplification, but is it a way that this is kind of turning into a land war? A land war in little spots oh, yeah, across yeah. the Pacific uh, rather than before? Yeah, sort of several or even dozens of little land wars, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I mean, it is, it is in many ways conventional ground combat. Mm -hmm. And if anything, sometimes these islands are so small it prevents the Americans from fully bringing all their weight to bear. For example, a small island with a limited front line, you can't just send in more and more troops to overwhelm them because the front line's not long enough. Well, that's right? true, yeah, right, okay. And so like, compare it with like France, where when the Americans break out of Normandy, they've got enormous room to maneuver. Or and the Russian front. <laughs> well, the Russian front, right, where you can make these big sweeping movements and you, if you have numerical superiority, you can really make it count. Whereas in some of these cramped little islands where you're yeah. fighting cave by cave, trench by trench, it becomes this sort of meat grinder of small unit tactics. Right, so, right. So the, the reason I'm asking that is because it sounds as if, in one way it could sound as if the Japanese are giving up and they're just desperately clinging right. on by their fingernails, but this actually does, there is a tactical tactical reasoning behind it. Sure. It could have worked. Right, or, to, or to, to, to complete the point I was, I was starting to make a minute ago, it, it, it you basically acknowledge that you're going to lose these islands. You're mm -hmm. going to lose these island battles. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes how. If you make it really, really painful for the Americans right. over and over and over again, yeah. the idea is you make the American campaign so costly that the Americans might sit down and negotiate. And that's the strategic purpose here. And I, w I would liken it in very broad terms to what the Confederacy does in 1864 in our, in our Civil War, uh, which is you know you're losing – the question okay. is, how good a peace can you get? If right, you if you right. take advantage, if you make if you stretch out the war, contribute to the northern body count, northern public opinion will turn against the war, which it was, by the way, not to mm -hmm, go deep in mm -hmm. the Civil War, which it was in the summer of 1864. And Lincoln, for example, worries about not being reelected in 1864. Oh, People yeah, forget yeah. that. So you you drag it out and make it so the the North, even though they're winning, they sit down and negotiate, and you get some terms or terms that are more favorable than you would get otherwise that's the hope the japanese in tokyo are clinging to in late 1944 that you can remember the ally the official allied policy is unconditional surrender yeah. which of course is anathema if you're in the japanese leadership no sure yeah yeah you yeah. don't want to be occupied and conquered and so if you can make these island battles even though you're losing the big losing the war in the big picture if you can make the u.s conquest of these islands sufficiently painful the americans might become war weary and sit down now, I can imagine that, it, I mean, I, again, and I'm saying this buzzkill is imagine because I don't know, uh, a lot of Japanese hi higher higher up commanders saying, look, you know, if if the war in Europe ends in sooner than this war, the American public might, as you say, get really tired. Right. Of this if, if, if the Pacific War drags into 46 and God forbid to 47. It's very it's right, quite, right, right. Having then, this negotiation settlement, right? Then they'll, have, then they'll have the comparison right in front of them. Like, so yeah. why is this war taking so long? Yeah, you, right? You, yeah, you, you, you never Nazis, know. How can we you know, and like when you're, when you're losing a war, 
you start to engage in wishful thinking. Yeah, sure. And we'll talk more about the, the Japanese leadership in a bit. But I should also mention at this point that another new Japanese tactic are the um, kamikaze attacks. Ah, yes, yes, famous. You've, yeah. you've lost control of the air. So really the only air weapon they believe they have left is basically pilots turning into suicide bombers. Right. You take a plane, you load it up with, with as much gas and explosives as you can, and with a minimally trained pilot who only knows how to take off and, and aim, basically. Yeah, not land. <laughs> yeah. Um, then you just and you, and you attack American invasion forces that way. That's another way of, of defending an island and making the American conquest of an island very, very painful, which in some ways they succeed in doing. Okay, then what were the last major island campaigns right and people should keep in mind that in any quick and dirty history like this you're leaving out a lot right and you're, sure. le yeah, and yeah, you're yeah, leaving yeah, out yeah. a lot of you know they're not minor engagements for the people who take part in them let's put it that way just the names of them everybody knows the names of them and i don't mean to just sure right, right ahead of time but right uh so the the first one is actually an early that i'll talk about is in early 1945 and that's iwo jima Mm -hmm. A pretty pretty famous campaign. This was a, in a way in sort of a textbook cave and bunker defense. I, I, should, I, should, I don't think I mentioned it, but these these fortification systems the Japanese build often they take advantage of existing terrain, existing caves. They connect the caves with tunnels. Yeah. They have very well concealed fighting positions and bunkers put in place. And so basically, the United States uh, lands. It's uh, certainly not unopposed, but they successfully land. But then comes the hard part, which is you basically have to blast and burn your way across the island. And if you read any account of, Iwo, of a place like Iwo Jima, it's so frustrating for the Americans because you you take out a Japanese position, a cave, for example, or a bunker, yeah, yeah. and you think you've secured it, and then you move on. And then the Japanese reappear in that same space and start to fire at you from behind. Oh, Lord. So in a way, it becomes... Well, it's it's sort of like the Viet Cong tunnels in, in Vietnam, no, right? You right, you, you right, you, you 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 think you've secured a perimeter, and now you're being fired on behind from behind. How did that happen? Well, it's not magic. They've got tunnels, yeah. and they can move around, and it becomes I don't want to sound glib, but it becomes sort of like whack a mole, yeah. right? Where yeah. you think you, you 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 haven't secured an area until you've secured every opening and every tunnel and every cave in the vicinity. Because uh. until you do, you think you've taken out a cave, and the Japanese can just move around and move back into it. So that's very frustrating and adds a lot to American casualties. It, Iwo Jima is successfully conquered by mid-March 1945, but 6,000 U.S. dead. 6,000 6, U.S. dead. That's more than, just for comparison, that's more dead than we lost in all of the Iraq War. Wow. In a single battle for a single island. 20,000 wounded. And a lot of these casualties, by the way, are inflicted on U.S. Marines by uh, an enemy that you, sometimes you don't even see yeah, because they're right. firing from such well-concealed positions or firing from behind. Now, if you're wondering about the Japanese garrison, the almost the entire Japanese garrison of 21,000 dies. The garrison in Iwo Jima. The garrison in Iwo Jima, right. There are very few, a handful of Japanese taken alive. Once again, mm -hmm. that was, that was how, that's how the Japanese fought. But what's interesting about Iwo Jima, big picture, is that if you look at those numbers, so 20, 26,000 U.S. casualties, right. 21,000 Japanese casualties, asterisk, those are almost all killed in action. Nevertheless, for the first time, the Japanese have succeeded in inflicting more casualties than they suffer. Oh, oh that hasn't casualties. Happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now, there have been some bloody battles up until this point for the Americans, but they have never suffered more casualties than they inflict on the Japanese defending a particular island. Wow. So if you're in Tokyo, you're thinking, well, so this is clearly how you defend an island. This is how you make taking an island super, super costly. So this this idea of making making the Americans pay so heavily, making the Allies pay so heavily, seems to be working. Right, right. If you're If you're in the Pentagon... And you say, wow, it's going to take us 6,000 dead, 20,000 wounded to take an island like that. And we have many more of these to take. Not, not even counting the mainland. Right. The Japanese exactly. main island. Sorry, it's not exactly. the mainland. But. Uh, absolutely. Right. So that, that's going to be very sobering. Right. Even though, by yeah. the way, you have done many, many things to improve your fighting ability. And you're using uh -huh. better weapons. And you you've have all this experience under your belt. And you know how to take an island now. Still... It's, this looks like it's going to be incredibly costly. So fast forward to the next, and it turns out, last major uh, island invasion, and that's Okinawa. Yep. Which is um, technically it's Japanese territory. It's part of the Ryukyu Islands to the mm -hmm. south mm -hmm. of the southernmost Japanese main island of Kyushu. 
It's about 350 miles from Japan proper. So keep in mind, 350 miles in the Pacific, that's like nothing at all. No, <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. well within your air cover, Yeah. for example. This is April to June 1945. Uh, another massive amphibious operation. The, I forget the numbers, but the uh, U.S. invasion fleet assembled for the invasion of Okinawa is by far the largest fleet ever assembled in the history of humanity. Oh my goodness. It, it really is. It really is. If you if you look into if you look at the the number of personnel, the number of aircraft carriers, just the firepower represented, it really does sort of reflect American power, military power at its zenith. There's no question about that. Yeah. There are lots of kamikaze attacks against the invasion force. Twenty eight ships are sunk and five thousand Americans are killed just in the kamikaze attacks. Wait, twenty eight ships? Yes. And five thousand. Ships of yeah. all sizes. Some of them are major, Maybe. some of them are minor, sure, but, but still. still 28 yeah, right. is a hell now, of a lot. Keep in mind, I forget the actual number of kamikaze attacks. Most kamikaze planes do not find their targets. Yeah, they, They've mm -hmm. shot down because of the, the wall of anti-aircraft fire yeah. and defensive fighter cover they have to get through is really formidable. And, of course, they could miss. Even if, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's right. Exactly. And that happens quite a bit. There are a lot of near misses or there are a lot of partial hits or the, like just the wingtip grazes the ship, that sort yeah. of thing. That happens quite a bit. But still, 28 ships were sunk with the loss of 5,000 American lives. Um, we can argue whether that's a lot or a little. It, it's it's a, a huge, right, if you lost 6,000, if you lost oh, 6,000 yeah. dead on Iwo Jima, this is 5,000 among people who haven't even set foot on the island. Lordy. So that's a large large amount and by the way this um this landing is completely unopposed in fact three quarters of the island of okinawa isn't even defended by the japanese wow which is sort of once again sort of exhibit a or maybe exhibit b of their new defense strategy yeah exactly. like it's yeah. a pretty big island if you try to defend the whole thing it's going to be like on macarthur on luzon right you try, try to defend uh, everything yeah. you try to defend everything you defend nothing there's no way you could possibly defend it you'll be too thin so you deliberately just give the americans three quarters of the island you defend the southern tip. You put up a series of incredibly strong defensive lines at the sort of a narrowest part of the island. Yeah. Right. So once again, they prevent the Americans from bringing their their all their force to bear, and it becomes this unbelievably brutal slugfest. I've re recommended it before. I recommend it again. HBO series The Pacific. Yes. Yes. Has a couple yes. of fantastic episodes. Fantastic in a bad way. Just very frankly exposing what the conditions were like on Okinawa mm -hmm. and how, for example, the Japanese use human shields at certain points among Ugh. the government because they have civilians at their disposal. It's this savage struggle. Some of the worst fighting in the war. Uh, finally, the Americans prevail and everyone knew that was going to happen. It was only a matter of time. 13,000 U.S. dead. Ugh. 100,000 Japanese soldiers and 100,000 native Okinawans who are Japanese citizens lose their lives oh. some of them just as what you might call i hate this term but collateral damage in other words civilian accidental yeah, sure. civilian death in combat because there's just so much firepower being unleashed but some of these and this had happened before happened before on saipan but uh in a larger scale here some of these japanese civilians including sort of parents with their children commit suicide yes yes because they've been fed a lot of propaganda about what's going to happen to them mm. if they fall into the hands of american soldiers and mm. marines so they commit suicide to avoid capture. A lot of them sort of jump off cliffs and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's, and particularly fa families doing that is very, very no, it's, it's, distressing. It's a, it's a dis distress, an added distressing dimension to an already really distressing campaign. Uh, so well, it's really, really costly. You know, I often think, and I think a lot of buzzkillers out there listening to this would think that if these islands are just kind of holdouts, and I don't mean that, you know, just five guys hiding in a cave, but it's definitely not being protected by lots of ships and lots of other uh, uh, military force. Why not just ignore them and go straight go, for the Japanese around, mainland? Right. No, it's a good question. And by the way, you've you've just summed up what has been the basic tactic of island hopping up until this point. Yeah. Like, for example, okay. major Japanese strong points like Rabaul down in um, MacArthur's theater, yeah. you know, he wanted to attack it. <laughs> by the way, I apologize for my string of gratuitous attacks against MacArthur's. Oh, by the way, really, we did a show on MacArthur yes, a couple of years did. ago. And you should check it out, but I'm not a fan, just to, just to give you a little preview. <laughs> and oh, yeah, no, I, no, I, 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 do, not, I yeah. do not apologize for a minute. But no, it is, it is a, a, a basic fact of island warfare, and what makes it so difficult to defend an island perimeter is if you strongly fortify someplace, the Americans can always go around you. 
Right. Okay. Right? Now, the problem here is that as you get this closer to Japan, most of the islands are very heavily defended, and you have to have these islands before you can invade Japan. You have to have a relatively close jumping off point. Oh, uh, okay, okay. For the next step. So this is one this is one island you can't hop, basically. Gotcha. Yeah, if, if, if that if that makes sense. The closer you the closer you start to get, the more right. fierce it has to be. You know, and be. by the way, it doesn't mean uh, Peleliu is often held up, and this is also shown in the Pacific, uh, is held up as an example the of this. HBO documentary. The HBO just, documentary, uh, no, movie, docudrama, I should say. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, there were island invasions which are highly dubious and, and maybe not strategically necessary. I don't, want, I don't want people to think that, oh, they've always got this down and they're always making the right decision, right? Oh, okay. Because sometimes you hop an island, sometimes you don't, and maybe you, the one you did, you could have hopped that one too. Peleliu, right. for example, is a great example. Super costly. Lots of uh, Americans die, and a lot of historians would say not for any good reason. Okinawa does not fall in that category. Yeah. It's so close in. It's Like I said, it's in the closest non-Japanese island chain. You really do have to take this island or one like it, and they're all heavily defended. And by the way, we should remind the buzzkillers out there that you should please go to our YouTube video of this episode because we've put up a lot of maps and right. uh, each each stage, each island chain we're talking about is, right. is It'll be visualized, on yeah. Because yep. otherwise, it just seems like this amorphous sea, literally. Right. But now we are really getting in quite quite close to Japan. Uh, close enough to then start this strategic bombing right. campaign. Right. Well, strategic strategic bombing you can do from a much greater distance. Yeah. But staging an invasion has to be close in. Right, because you're because oh, okay. you're you're moving an invasion force and, and lots of men and equipment and all that that, that you can't send over thousands of miles of sea yeah. that you have to do from close in and also because you need fighter cover uh, right. as opposed to oh I see strategic I see bombers, right? can't just... it, it was like when we talked about D Day right you have Normandy is chosen partly because it's within Allied fighter cover you have to have local fighter cover to overcome the natural advantages that the defenders have in a amphibious operation. Okay, so it's not just the bombers coming in from Tinian and Delay and all right. these places. They've got to have smaller planes to protect them, and those smaller planes can't come from Tinian because it's too far out. That's so right. they need, okay, right. all so right. And, that, and okay. that's why you have to have additional island hopping. And, and they're really sort of parallel campaigns. B-29s aren't really, aren't in fact, not never, are, aren't involved in support of amphibious operations. They're waging strategic economic warfare against Japanese cities and Japanese okay. factories. Yeah. Whereas tactical air cover, fighter planes, which are very short range, those you have to have close in, and there, and you need, uh, the, so you need a, a base that's much closer to Japan from which to stage an invasion force. That's I don't why see Okinawa. How in the world, this could be more complicated than it is. So oh my just, God! And just the, all the logistical and the the support troops and the planning and the intelligence that goes into these things is just amazing. And I haven't even scratched that surface. Okay, so when I, so my my conception then is mistaken that that oh, okay now this sort of clears the way for the big bombers leading up to the atomic bomb. But right. what this what really does is. It, clears the way for a strategic bombing campaign, like you say, right. of lots of different types of aircraft. No, yeah, yes. And you can even make an argument, and some people have, that you technically, if you look at, the, with hindsight, and if you look at the way the war's going by 1945, you can make an argument you don't need Iwo Jima and Okinawa. That with your naval blockade, in other words, you're strangling Japan, partly with, with submarines, yeah. and control of the sea, and your B-29s operating at long range... You can continue to pummel Japan without additional costly island invasions that move you closer to Japan. Okay, right. If you really, if if you weren't concerned about the war dragging on, big uh, if, big yeah. if, there's no reason why the United States couldn't have continued to bomb Japan. Forgive the expression, back into the Stone Age from long distance because that's what it was yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. bombers. By the way, Iwo Jima and Okinawa were never turned into strategic bomber bases. Huh. Iwo Jima was useful for B-29s that needed a place to crash land if they, <laughs> if they weren't going to make it back to Saipan uh, or Tinian yeah, okay. because that was so much further away. But they never developed that, probably because Tinian was turned into this amazing, if, if the equivalent of a modern international airport that could yeah. support hundreds of B-29s. The whole island is oh turned my God. But People should runways. go look at a map of Tinian, by the way. And they named the runways things like Broadway, <laughs> 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 which only the Americans would do. No, but the CBs, the construction battalions, they did an amazing job just developing these islands into incredibly advanced uh, strategic bomber bases. But you mentioned strategic bombing. So strategic bombing had started earlier from China with these B-29s. It was not very effective. 
Curtis LeMay, who we've talked about in other episodes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and in other contexts, he was put in charge of the bombing campaign from the Marianas. And we won't get into the details, but the changes he made uh, were very, very effective. And he turned the B-29 force into a truly awesome weapon of destruction uh, when it was set loose on Japanese cities. More and more by February, March 1945, Japanese cities start to be systematically devastated. Uh, lar- partly, right, through, right. partly through use of incendiaries. A lot of Japanese, in fact, most Japanese cities, uh, the residential areas are largely made of wood and paper. Now, let's remind the buzzcos what an incendiary bomb actually is. Sorry, they are they are very small bombs, which means you can have a lot of them in one plane. Yeah, and their only purpose is to start fires. Okay, now are there are there uh, uh, flammable slash inflammable? The the technical term is inflammable, but most people it's one one of those odd. It is English language. (laughs) Two words, Uh, opposite words that mean the same thing. uh, Is there is there a gasoline type thing in the bomb itself that that makes it worse? It's essentially a form of napalm, which is sort of jellied gasoline. So wow. when you when the bomb detonates, it explodes and it, it flies in different directions and it actually sort of clings and burns. But it's designed to start fires. Your average aerial bomb, a fragmentation bomb with high explosives, yeah. is, is is meant to bring down a building through blast, right? Blow right. out the walls and right. make it collapse. And by the way, and sometimes as we talked about this in the the um, strategic, I think we, the Dresden episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Europe, certainly they drop some high explosives first. Yeah, to basically prepare the buildings for incendiaries, and I know that sounds perverse because it is kind of is. But Japanese cities and Japanese air defenses are essentially non-existent. Yeah, while by this stage, bomber yeah. Yeah. losses among B-29s over Japan is extremely low compared mm-hmm. to what's going on in Europe. And some are shot down, but very few compared to what's going on in Europe. And so a lot of Japanese cities are being bombed. By the way, your average big Japanese city that has a lot of industry in it is bombed several times. Oh, they would, they would be revisited to sort of finish the job. And a lot of these, no, I don't think any of these cities are completely annihilated, but mm-hmm. a lot, most major Japanese cities with any industry to speak of are heavily damaged and parts of them wrecked. Oh, I think we may have talked about the bombing of Tokyo in March 1945. Yeah. Where oh, I, I gave a talk once and I um, started out by describing the conditions on the ground in Tokyo, but I didn't say it was Tokyo. And if you look at the description, you could easily assume it was Hiroshima. For example, right. yeah, reports yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of molten glass drifting through the air yeah. because there's so many fires. It was a firestorm. 100,000 people were killed in Tokyo, March 9, 10, 1945, which is more than at Hiroshima on yeah. August 6, 1945, and done with conventional bombing. Yeah. So a lot of these cities are – a quarter of Tokyo was just completely erased. And Tokyo even then was massive. Oh, yeah. Ge- not only population but geographically right. massive. Yeah, basically 16 square miles just completely erased. Yeah. And by the by the way, we we know we most people only think of Tokyo and then Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but you you talk about all these, um, for lack of a better term, secondary cities were that were were destroyed, and that's where a lot of industry industry was. Absolutely right. Places like Kobe and Yokohama, yeah, right? And, yeah, and Nagoya, places like that. They were all bombed. And by the way, additional condemnation is is uh, is called for uh, on the Japanese leadership because they knew this was all going on. They they saw yeah. or should have seen what was going on, what was happening to their people in their cities, and they can and they still said to themselves, "Well, we need to continue to fight on." Oh. That that means that means a lot of this additional death after this point is is on their hands. This is not right. just oh, yeah, 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 the, yeah. just not just the product of American war making. This is the product of a Japanese leadership, same with the German leadership, that really is completely indifferent to the fate of their own people. Yeah, which is genuinely sick. It is. It is. It is super sick. So we, all these people are killed, but then what are some of the other other impacts? Right. Like so, what? Well, by early to mid nineteen forty five, Japanese war making ability is suffering mightily, and not only because of their battlefield losses, but also because of what's happening to their industry. Mm-hmm. They can know their production has started to go way down simply because their factories are being destroyed. Yeah, they cannot yeah. produce enough ammunition, new planes, uh, new equipment for their military. Their industry is being ravaged. Production drops. As you get into mid-1945, the Japanese transportation network is increasingly targeted. Oh, okay. So, in other words, for example, the railroad network within Japan is starting to be targeted. Uh, and by the way, let's let's be frank, this is partly because the U.S. Army Air Force is starting to run out of targets. 
Oh. There, and and I was like, what do we do now? Well, we've bombed all these cities. We bombed all these factory areas. And so they start to hit the transportation network. Let's blow this railway bridge. With, yeah, these bridges, these these railroad trains, these harbors. Uh, so their economy really starts to suffer. And the idea that, I don't want to get into the whole atomic bomb debate, but the idea, if you look at what's happening to Japan without an atomic bomb, the idea that they would have otherwise fought on, like, for example, deep into 1946, really is ridiculous. They're just, they would not have had the ability to wage war just because of what the American bomber force was doing to their cities and their industry. Okay, so they literally couldn't have done it. Because they couldn't have done it, right. Okay. I mean, you know, and you can argue about when that point would have been reached. Yeah. Uh, but it was going to be reached. Um, certainly in 1946 would be my guess. The Japanese, uh, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it here again. The Japanese also is increasingly strangled by U.S. submarines. Oh, this is another thing I don't think of, submarines. Uh, we ought to do a submarine show, and, and partly because I was just uh, I was just in Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And at Pearl Harbor, they have it's not just the Arizona Memorial. They also have the USS Bowfin, which was a World War II submarine huh. that's been refurbished and is now on display, and you can take a, you can take a self-guided tour through it. It is fascinating. If the uh, buzz killers ever go to Pearl Harbor, make sure you do it, because it's not every day you get to no, not inside tour. Of I mean, we have one in, in Pittsburgh. It's technically a post-World War II. Uh, it's a 1945 submarine. I, I don't think it saw any combat. The Bofin certainly did. The Bofin was one of the more successful U.S. submarines. It's a relatively small force, this U.S. Yeah, submarine yeah, force. Yeah, yeah. After they figure out that their torpedoes don't work, <laughs> Which takes them about two years. Only in 1943 did we realize that we're scoring hits. Well, do we fully deal with the, the, the fact that we're scoring hits with our torpedoes and all, all the Japanese here is a thud uh, because our, our torpedoes were defective. Uh, we, we finally perfect torpedoes that work. We weed out some of our less aggressive submarine commanders and are with a relatively small force. It's smaller than Germany's U-boat force. It's only a few dozen submarines but oh, japanese okay. have completely neglected anti-submarine warfare well, that's interesting we for do, an island nation yeah oh, yeah among their many many mistakes uh now we did lose submarines it was still very hazardous duty yeah but uh our small submarine force by 1945 is also running out of targets oh so thoroughly devastated has i forget the exact percentage but Something I want to say something like thirty or forty percent of Japanese shipping is destroyed, uh, or that is destroyed is destroyed by U.S. submarines. They they get no love, but they deserve it. <laughs> they are acting with impunity. Remember, it's big picture: Japan is an island nation that is resource dependent on the outside world. It must have open shipping lanes to bring in oil, sure. and food, the basics. Right? Yeah. We're not just talking things like bauxite and manganese. We're talking about basic <laughs> stuff like rice and oil. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, and it's been like that for a long, for centuries. You know, and it's not like all of a sudden in the 20th yes, century they become dependent. They're, they're like yeah. Britain, actually. Yeah, exactly. They're very ana analogous. And the problem here is that the Japan is being successfully strangled. And this would be another reason why I think they wouldn't have lasted long into 1946. They are, in 1945, before they surrender, there were already s signs of severe malnutrition in Japan. Wow. They don't have enough rice to feed their own people. And this is partly because... The life expectancy of a Japanese freighter, you can probably count in days. Oh, no kidding. It, because And it's extremely hazardous duty because you know that yeah. out, sitting outside your harbors, first of all, there are lots of naval mines, Yeah, which also overlooked. Our B-29s also drop from the air a lot of naval mines. These are mines that float underwater. They they basically have a, a weight and a chain. Oh, okay. And then they, they're designed, right? They, they figure out what the depth of the water is where they're dropping it. And so then they basically float under the water. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they don't float the, on the surface. Uh, they float under the water yeah, sure, at sort of them, yeah. at sort of hull depth. Yeah. And so a lot of Japanese ships are sunk by U.S. mines that have been dropped by American airplanes, which once again control of the air allows you to do. Oh, I thought you had to lay mines with a mine laying. No, on and the that ship. I mean that is the conventional way to do it. But this is a whole. But when you're in the Americans and you have this all this lavish military power yeah, yeah. at your disposal and all this uh, this sort of technological gift, yeah, you and so they drop. Your average Japanese harbor by mid-1945 is just this nightmare for Japanese shipping. Right, 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 because right. Because if right. you make it through the mines, then there are American submarines waiting for you. Yeah. And it's not like these these cargo ships are heavily armored or anything. No. Like that. They might be... Uh, might have uh, no. convoys. Your average to torpedo them, but, yeah. or mine is has qu quite enough high explosive to punch a fatal hole in the hull of one of these ships. Yeah. What seems to be happening, it's just... it's it's, it's 
I mean, again, this is sort of, uh, I don't want to say presentist, but it's sort of like jumping ahead of the story that everything is closing on in on Japan at the same time, yes. all at the same rate of intensity. Mm-hmm. But Japan is still fighting on. Yeah. It is. Why is that? It is amazing. Uh, the end of the day, you have to look at sort of the character and the mentality of the Japanese leadership. Yeah. It's basically, it's run by military people. Uh-huh. There's a Supreme War Council, which is not entirely made up of military people, but mostly. Right. These are people who have all absorbed the code of the Bushido. Right. right. These are the That's people it. who yeah. think that s- s- surrender is inconceivable to them. Right. Because if you surrender, you're worse than a dog. And we, I think we talked about this. This is one of mm-hmm. the reasons why they mistreat mm-hmm. allied POWs mm-hmm. so badly. Because you surrender to me, you're a dog. Yeah. You're supposed to fight to the death. You're supposed to die for the emperor. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, and basically, there should be no soldier or sailor alive when the war ends, essentially. Ugh. I mean, I, there are times when I read about this thing. This is, this is not a military. This is a death cult. Yeah. That, that's really what it sounds like if you look at the way they think. Well, bus killers were breaking the fourth wall by explaining how we run the show here a little bit. Professor Nash provides these wonderful script outlines. And, and one of the things, he, two of the things he mentions here in this section is feckless and delusional Japanese leadership hopes. Right. right? That, that's how I would describe them. Feckless and delusional. Feckless in that none of them seems to have any independent will. None of them ask any hard questions. None of them is, is willing to engage in debate. And this is partly a cultural thing, I'm, I'm sure. But basically, they're on autopilot. They, they, know, they don't know to do anything but to continue fighting. Is this why one of the reasons why that death cult thing, thing yes, seems to be? Yes, I think a that's good part of it. I think it's an right, For example, and if you're part of that, I'll use the word cult. If you're part of that cult, who's going to be the first person to say, "Hey, you know what? This is a ridiculous cult. Yeah. I want out." <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. that that could get you cashiered. By the way, that could get you killed. Yeah, that, could, sure. that could get you killed, even killed by one of your subordinates. Yeah. Right, right. Who's uh, who? Uh, by the way, a lot of the problem here are the mid-level and lower-level people who are the true, the true believers, and they are constantly looking out for superiors who are too weak. And, wow. You know, and and this, this, by the way, I, I was reading a book about 1941 and how Japan gets into the war, and a lot of the driving force for that decision for war is not the top people; it's the mid-level people pushing the people on the top, and the people at the top scared that they're going to appear weak to their oh, underlings. Oh my god! So. That's how sort of ridiculous this is, but also delusional, and that then that's something different from the death cult, different from the the willingness to sort of fight to the death. Mm-hmm. Is that, that you continue to cling to hope, you continue to spin these these fantasy scenarios in your head by which oh, if only X Y Z happens, yeah. we won't lose. Yeah, you know, you saw this in Nazi Germany. Well, our wonder weapons. If we fight long enough, the Allies will fall apart. Right? Yeah. It's all ridiculous in retrospect. There's no way it was going to happen, but you yeah. continue to cling to it because that can also help justify you fighting on. Yeah. And, and well, but but for those things to be successful, every single one of those things has to happen in the right that's way right. and the chances of that are, right. are minuscule. Exactly. And one of the main things they're clinging hope to here is sort of at the, at the, at the diplomatic realm. And, ah, and people yeah, should yeah, remember yeah. that even at this late date, sort of uh, June, July 1945, the Soviet Union is a neutral power in the Pacific. Yes, and that's fascinating of course because <laughs> it's one of the big yeah, land masses right so i mean and it, it's a world war it's a global war most people are involved but yeah. not everyone on every front yeah yeah and so yeah. if you're wondering like well so who cares well the japanese are holding out hope and some of their diplomats are busy in this in this regard they're holding out hope that through the quote-unquote neutral soviet union right they can negotiate a peace that is better for japan than unconditional surrender again this whole idea of Trying to get keeping the war going or keep technically as long as possible to, to to get a better peace. And by the way, we should stress that it's not the Soviets and the and the Japanese have signed a peace uh, or non aggression pact. That's or right, nineteen forty one. Right. Yeah, uh, and, and it's not just because it's not so. I hear this all the time. It's not so, solely because the so, Soviets are f- fraidy cats or anything. They, no. They've got a lot of, to worry about on their own. Right. <laughs> right. They want their Western front, the, the Germans. German front. They worked very hard to avoid a two front war. Right, right, right. And by the way, at Yalta in February 1945, they do agree to join yeah. the war against Japan, which they it turns out they do almost three months to the day. They, they, agreed, to, they agreed to do within three months, almost three months to the day they do join the war. And let's remember, they, this happens at the same time as the atomic bomb attacks. 
So August 6th, Hiroshima, Hiroshima is bombed. We did an atomic bomb show. I'm not going to go yeah. into it. Uh, Hiroshima is attacked on, um, is bombed with an atomic bomb on August 6th. Nagasaki three days later, August 9th. In the wee, depending on where you are in the world, in the wee morning hours of August 9th, the same day that Nagasaki is bombed, the Soviets attack Japan. They declare war on Japan and attack in Manchuria. It is a devastating offensive. It only ends up lasting a few days or weeks. But this is the massive Red Army that has now been brought to a very, very sharp point by fighting against the Germans for oh, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. They know what they're they doing, have, yeah. Oh, they, they're super skilled. They're super tough veterans. They've got vastly superior numbers and equipment. And they basically, the Japanese Kwantung Army is what it's called in Manchuria. Yeah, yeah. The Soviets go through it like a hot knife through butter. Yeah. The Japanese suffer devastating losses. And, and, and you often hear or sometimes hear from, you know, talk radio morons we are not talk radio morons we are <laughs> podcast we're much brighter than moron uh, uh that you know the, the soviets only jumped in because oh they've they've dropped these tremendous atomic bombs there let's let's get on let's get it get yeah. in on well, the I kill. Mean, they, they do want to get in on the kill but this is this was arranged well also in advance part of the right, right. It's almost as you say to the day when they agreed to do it right well and also the, and this reflects a very quickly changing attitude in washington in february it's like wow japan's going down hard we really need the help of soviet manpower in other words we need soviet manpower to help us out the way that they did in europe yeah then fast forward to the atomic bombs and maybe the war is going to come quickly. And now it's like, oh, wow, we really don't want the Soviets involved because then we might have oh. to share uh, the occupation of Japan with the Soviets. Yeah, like the occupation and of Germany. Exactly. Yeah. We don't want to have to split Japan the way we have already split Germany. And so now becomes a reason why we want this to end quickly, mm. especially once the, once the Soviet troops have become involved. So even after all this, after two atomic bombs and after... Yeah, Nagasaki's on the 9th. On the 9th, and after the Soviet move in Manchuria, the Supreme War Council in Tokyo is still split 3-3. 3-3? 3 3 and buskillers out there should know Dr. Nash's iron rule of committees, which is when yeah. you're forming a committee, <laughs> make sure it's an odd number. All the committees that in, the, in the Institute have Gracious, an odd number of people. this is not rocket surgery, people. If you, have, <laughs> if you have an even number, you might get a tie. Yeah. And right. then what? Especially if you have no provisions for breaking a tie. <laughs> really, people? Are you running a modern country or not? <laughs> well, maybe subconsciously this is a way just to keep, <laughs> right, they want exactly. to keep losing. And then, yeah. yeah no, obviously, it could have gone 5-1 or 4-2, but no, it's 3-3. Three, three. Wow. Uh, and the P, so if you're wondering, like, so who are these two sides? You have what are called the, the Peace Party and the War Party. Right. And three they, people on the Peace Party, three people on the War right, Party. That's right, exactly. Council, anyway. And on the Supreme War Council. And the Peace Party, basically, they are the relatively realistic group, as you might imagine, as, as the name might imply. It's like, we are losing badly. Let's end this thing. But still, they also have a, they have a condition. They don't want to accept unconditional surrender. Their condition is we get to keep the emperor, which, okay. if you know about Japan in this period, that makes certain sense. All Japanese of all stripes revere the emperor. The emperor has a sort of sure, semi-godlike yeah, yeah, yeah. status. You can't imagine Japan without the emperor. The emperor and Japan are one. That's not something you're going to give up. That's something you would continue to fight for. Right. Which, by the way, if we can just take a step back here, is one of the criticisms by some people of American policy, which is if you announce unconditional surrender against a country like Japan, they're going to fight to the death. Yeah, because of the emperor. Right. Couple that with the more realistic approach to wars, which is there's no such thing as an unconditional surrender in reality. There are always conditions. They might be harsh, they might be lenient, but there are always conditions. Yeah, right, so right, it's great right, propaganda, right. unconditional surrender. It actually, and people like Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, he understood this. Yeah. Our own policy has gotten in the way of war termination. Yeah. Because, of course, the Japanese are going to fight to death because of their emperor. He knew a little bit about Japanese culture, by the way. I sometimes wonder whether that's whether American public opinion at the time was sort of massaged by the American government to concentrate on the evils of Japan as being Tojo, as being... And, and you know, you don't, you never, don't ever see we're fighting against so the like, emperor. In other words, so, like, separate the government from the people? Yeah. Or, yeah or, I don't or, know... I, 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 I don't know how careful American propaganda was, and I certainly know we don't wouldn't know what its effect was. My yeah, no, my no, no, no. sense is the Japanese in general were demonized. Yeah, okay. And so that maybe, yeah. we're, let's keep in mind one of my um, most dis the disturbing factoids I like to trot out, which is a Gallup poll in November 1944 found that 13 percent of Americans advocated extermination of all Japanese on the planet. Oh, 
Now, God. you could argue that a glass is half empty, right? That with all the propaganda and hatred in Pearl Harbor and Bataan, that maybe it should have been higher than 13%. But still, about one American in, what, seven thought that the way you deal with the defeated Japan is you kill all Japanese on the planet, men, women, children, exterminate them as a race. That gives you some idea of the added. In other words, and so to me, that means a lot of Americans don't differentiate between okay, the Japanese okay, leadership so, and the Japanese yeah. people. That they are right. that, that they as as a people they are a scourge. Yeah, like I said, there's a minority. Kind of but, reminds me of that that uh, thing in, in the Versailles peace negotiations where some people talk about the pastoralization, right. forced pastoralization right. of and Germany. Especially, and let's remember, this is total war that goes on for years, yeah. and people have been saturated with propaganda. That has a cumulative effect. You're, oh, yeah. you're hyping oh, people yeah. up. You're getting people on edge for war. You can't just turn that off like a light switch. No. People are going to remain fired up and that and that, you know, that you've let that genie out of the bottle and now when you may oh. want to put it back in, um the genie is not cooperating. Okay, so, well so so we were talking so we have we're talking about the the two basic right. war council parties, the right. peace party and then there's right. the peace party basically says we'll surrender if we keep the emperor. That's right. their stance. All right. That stance is anathema to the war party the war, the war party, party here's their okay, stance gotcha. basically which is we'll, we'll stop fighting we'll give up you win the war but we disarm ourselves oh okay. which is I'm, I'm assuming is partly an honor thing yeah right yeah, handing okay. over your weapons and your sword we disarm ourselves but in other words we're in control of that process yeah which what conquering army would ever <laughs> yeah sure you, you you fellas take care of it yourselves yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. we'll just hang we'll back and watch you. right yeah. Um, we will deal with our war criminals ourselves. Yikes. Yeah. Who, who, who will guard the guardians? That's a sort of, <laughs> sort of interesting uh, chapter in that story, right? Where we expect the Americans to sit back and remember Americans have been victims of war crimes. American oh, absolutely. people, the American people already calling, know about it, are, know about them and are calling for some heads, yeah. but we'll let the Japanese deal with their own war criminals. Yeah. Who, by the way, parenthetically, a lot of the Japanese don't even view them as war criminals. So well, how do you think that trial is going to go? Yikes. And this is the kicker. No occupation of Japan. Okay. So in one way, it's the war party is still a surrender party, except there's well, the, the so can, many the conditions. Can, the conditions are, like use the D word, delusional. Yeah, they're the, the, they're the war that surrender. The Americans the surrender would war go party. for this. By the way, there were also people in the war party, maybe not in the, in the uh, Supreme War Council, there are high-ranking Japanese who also are like, yeah, we'll surrender, but we get to keep China. <laughs> like, in other words, in other words, basically a do-over. Let's just pretend Pearl Harbor didn't happen. We'll go back to November 1941, big, powerful empire without us attacking, you know, <laughs> let bygones be bygones. <laughs> I mean, that, if that's not delusional, if like, is there some stronger word than delusional? Yeah, yeah Delusional know. doesn't quite capture it. Freud would have a field day on this, but that, and also, that's how ignorant they are about what they're up against. And and also, the, the just the... S- the sick nature of war crimes in China by the Japanese. Oh yeah, there's, there's yeah. no way they could get up. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. I mean, there's oh. the, the lack. I mean, human beings are t- typically not known for their self awareness, but the yeah. lack of self awareness here, the lack of sort of situational awareness, mm-hmm. if I'll use the mm-hmm. modern term, is, is just appalling. So the full cabinet then meets. Uh, August 9th, tenth. So this is after these events, after the atomic bombings, after and the after, after the, the Soviet, Soviet okay. after that. I mean, let's keep in mind that 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 hail mary you've been banking on, right? A negotiated yeah. peace with the Soviets. That window has shut because the Soviets they're no uh. longer neutral. They've declared war on you. Your situation has changed radically. Still, the war cabinet is deadlocked, and that's still when, three three again. Still three three. Lordy. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again: feckless and delusional. <laughs> you're, you're, are you running a country in a war effort or not? The F and D. Yeah, yeah, yeah F and D. Uh, this is when the emperor, uh, without precedent, intervenes. Oh, okay. Uh, le- him personally. Now, remember, he. It, it's a complicated issue. Partly, it's an evidentiary problem. We don't know everything because a lot of the key documents were burned. Yeah, sure. by the Japanese. And also the Americans after the war are interested in making the emperor look good because we've left him in place. Ah, uh, of so course. a lot yeah. of layers to this. The one the conditional is, or unconditional. Yeah. We, after the war, we sort of made him this apolitical, aloof figure who had mm-hmm. nothing to do with the Japanese mm-hmm. war effort, mm-hmm. which is a lie uh, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. really untrue. We have much clearer uh, evidence now about his big picture complicity and, for example, the origins of war, the war in the Pacific. Yeah. But he finally intervenes as far as we know. He intervenes on behalf of the peace party. This intervention, like I, I'm pretty sure it's without precedent. 
he has right, right. informal ways of having a say yeah. in policy and he sets a tone and people clear things with him informally. Again, not that different from the British market. Right, or some other systems, but this is a formal intervention. This is oh, him okay. showing up right. at the meeting and saying, essentially, this has to end. I'm the tiebreaker. Um, yeah, exactly. Finally. And after this, on August 14th, or I think August 13th, no, take that back, August 10th, they send a message to the United States, we will surrender if the emperor is preserved. Uh-huh. So, and by the way, keep. I think I talked about this in the atomic bomb episode, but keep this in mind, even after the Soviet declaration of war and two atomic bombs, the Japanese stance still isn't, okay, we give up, no conditions. Yeah. It's still, all right, we'll surrender if we keep the emperor. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're still insisting on a condition. And then the Americans famously respond with this sort of indirect response, which is, and the quote is, the emperor will be subject to the supreme allied commander of the allied, the supreme commander of the allied powers. Uh, In other words, they don't say, you get to keep your emperor. Yeah. Which, because that might not go over really big in some circles. You basically. Back in the U.S. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or, you sort, of, Britain, you sort yeah. of elide the issue and by, by describing his status as subordinate to the allied commander. But the subtext is clear. You get to keep your emperor. Yeah. So, by the way. In theory, it pleases everyone. Just for those of you keeping score at home, it's not unconditional surrender. We grant no, that's them, right. We grant yeah, them yeah, a yeah, condition, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that yeah, was yeah. also one of the reasons the Japanese surrender. And I still see it all the time, this 100% correlation. We drop atomic bombs, and then the Japanese surrender. End of story. Yeah. You should be asking yourself, why is there this five-day gap between the Japanese announcement of their surrender yeah. and yeah. Nagasaki? Yeah. The, they had a full meeting schedule? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what, why do we have this five-day lag? And the answer yeah. is the Japanese were still insisting on a condition, and they got it. So this is the biggest myth of the end of the it's Pacific War. It's one of the big myths, and it drives me nuts. You still see documentaries, and then they show an atomic, they show an atomic explosion, and then the war ended. Yeah. Heavily implying, if not outright saying, that this is one-on-one -on -one correlation. That's the only reason they surrendered. As we like to say here on the show, it's more complicated than <laughs> yeah, that. The C word. So the Japanese announced their surrender on August 14th. By the way, there is an attempted military coup. Oh, Lord. When it's clear the Japan that the emperor has sided with the peace party, there are some junior officers who go nuts and they invade the palace and want to kill him. What's well, the junior officers? So again, junior is this middle le yeah. mid level of. The hardest of the hardcore. Wow. And. Well, of course, and they are willing to give their own lives, certainly, sure, as some of them yeah. do. They think this is so outrageous that they will kill their god emperor. Holy that, cow. Well, again, that's not delusional. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll use that clinical term. Yeah. Uh, and then the final surrender takes place um, uh, on September 2nd. But I have to, I have to mention the, um, the broadcast of the – it was called an imperial rescript – I what does that mean? I don't. I have not looked into it. I, they, the, the, the Japanese use this word all the time, or it's the English translation of the Japanese word, rescript. It's like an official imperial announcement, uh -huh. or a, but it has a higher status. It's like a white paper or something like that, or I don't okay. know what the British equivalent would be, but it's a relatively rare, formal statement of royal policy. And so now let's listen to an excerpt of the audio from the Japanese emperor giving that imperial rescript broadcast. Kaku, We've only given you a short extract from the beginning of the Emperor's Imperial Rescript, and here's the translation of what you just heard as reported in the New York Times on August 15th, 1945. Quote, To our good and loyal subjects, after pondering deeply the general trends of the world and the actual conditions obtaining in our empire today, we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation by resorting to an extraordinary measure. We have ordered our government to communicate to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration. End quote. 
We put the full text of the Imperial Rescript in the blog post for this episode, and of course you can find that on ProfessorBuzzKill.com. That, and by the way, uh, that is the first time the Japanese public ever heard the Emperor's voice. Yeah, That's, that's how sort of aloof and sort of ethereal and sort of mysterious the Japanese Emperor was in Japanese society. So they broadcast his voice reading that Imperial Rescript, and, that's, and people were like, among other things, oh, so that's what the Emperor sounds like. Yeah, that's amazing. Yep. That's amazing. And so then, and that is, as I said, that leads to the official surrender on board the USS Missouri, which you can also visit at Pearl Harbor. I, I realize I'm sounding like part of the Hawaiian Tourism yeah. Promotion Board, <laughs> but I was just in Hawaii, and Pearl Harbor is an amazing historical site. And you, they have refurbished the, the USS Missouri, one of our massive battleships. You can actually go to what's called the Surrender Deck. Wow. Which is and you've very, seen pictures of this MacArthur. Uh, yeah, so and, extremely, extremely... Um, uh, stage tiny, tiny area. Oh, it's a stage, but it's a really tiny area where they cram all these people in. By the way, I have to add some more, a little bit of uh, MacArthur bashing that I just found out. <laughs> when he, by the he, way, hate mail at professorbuzzkill <laughs> exactly. Those those lingering MacArthur fans out there, you send the hate, hate mail to that address. Uh, MacArthur was evacuated out of the Philippines before the U.S. forces in the Philippines surrendered in 1942, yeah. so he could continue the struggle. Yeah, the commander left in charge was Jonathan Wainwright. Yeah, who then spent better part of four years in Japanese captivity, oh. which was brutal for, as for most POWs. When he's, when he's uh, liberated, he's skin and bones. Mm -hmm. MacArthur didn't want Wainwright to take part in the surrender ceremony. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Uh, there's a picture of, I, I saw a picture of them hugging and the caption said, MacArthur didn't want Wainwright there because Wainwright was a, was a reminder of MacArthur's defeat in the Philippines. Oh, talk about <laughs> out of control egos. Now you know why I don't think very highly of Doug Out Doug. Yeah, uh, well, you would think also that <laughs> Wainwright could have been used as the, especially because he was a POW, he, they could right. surrender to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and he was not the, uh, Percival, the British commander in Malaya and Singapore was also on hand, and he was skin and bones. And 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 uh, big picture, not not <sighs> due to MacArthur, but uh, there there were people in the Allied camp who wanted people to see, look, this is what, yeah, this is what yeah, the Japanese yeah, yeah. did to people in captivity. Yeah, even the top. top There's also guys. a bit of payback, right? You know, you have your losing commanders who yeah. get to get to uh, have the the victory dance in the end. Yeah, yeah. This surrender's got so many threads to it. Can we say why is right. is there one answer? Is it two answers? Five answers? Why did Japan right. surrender? Uh, in a way, this is going to be a cop out because you're supposed to rank factors when you come up with a list, right? Yeah. So that just yeah, become, yeah. doesn't yeah. become this undifferentiated list. I'll defend this partly because it's difficult to say with certainty what yeah. percentage of this was responsible. Once again, partly because it's not a it's not a matter of what you're doing; it's a matter of what impact what you're doing has on the Japanese, and we don't understand that fully because yeah. of evidentiary issues. But it's pretty clear that the Japanese finally, finally managed to overcome their their systemic and mental flaws and throw in the towel. It's a combination of the atomic bombs, yeah, the combined air and naval blockade. Mm -hmm. Which is which has been devastating and has, is devastating on its own. The Soviet declaration of war, right, and the Allied concession that the Japanese get to keep the emperor. You put together all those factors. I don't think I'm leaving out any major factors. Those are the major factors why the Japanese finally surrender when they surrender on August 14th. 1945. So that's a lot. And again, it's complex. And it's complex. It's strands. much more nuanced than it's often presented, even in documentaries. Uh, World War II with VJ Day, August 14th, 1945. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the jubilation in the United States in particular is enormous. World War II is finally over. Remember VE Day, victory in Europe, that was months earlier. World War II is finally over. Uh, I would just I would just end with a lament for the price paid by the peoples of Asia and the Ameri the United States and the Pacific. Uh, the price paid for fanatical Japanese militarism. The price was tens of millions of dead people. Yes, uh, and, absolutely devastating loss. Buzzkillers may remember a show we did a couple of years ago on I think t entitled "Why Was World War II So right. Bad." And looking at the Pacific, the Asian casualties and the Asian deaths, yes. enormous, especially yes. the Chinese. Especially civilians. the Chinese, right? Uh, it is that, just, just yeah, literally I'll, shocking I'll, to the core. I'll, yeah, a lot, a lot of the explanation for why World War II is so deadly happens in Asia and the Pacific. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, sorry to end on that depressing note about human nature, buzzkillers, but 
We are here to tell you what we believe to be the truth, and the, and, and in in the truth there are an awful lot of complications. Please, 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 send us email info at Professor Buzzkills. You know, join us on the Twitter and all that stuff. Uh, fortunately, despite all the threats of flooding, we are we haven't been overwhelmed yet. Although it is starting a major rainstorm has just moved we have in not again. donned our hip waders yet. Not yet, not yet, but it's looking pretty dicey. So before we drown. Let me just say uh, goodbye, and we'll talk to you next week. This is General George Washington. I never go into battle or start a new country without consulting Professor Buzzkill. Professor Buzzkill is part of Entertainment One's podcast network and is available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and all major podcast apps. Please subscribe and leave him a review. Please also go to ProfessorBuzzKill.com to support him on Patreon, to subscribe to his email notifications, and to shop the Buzzkill bookshelf. Follow him on Facebook, on Twitter at BuzzkillProf, and on Instagram at ProfessorBuzzkill. Thanks for listening.